Has anyone ever said to you, I, I was trying to describe you to someone, and I was struggling to think of just how to do it. And it sort of implies that you're, that, that, that you're not easy to describe. And I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult, but it definitely implies you're not an easy person to summarize at all. Well, if someone said to you, describe to me Jesus, how would you do it? How do you summarize Jesus? How would you describe him to someone? If you're going to introduce Jesus to somebody, how would you do it? Now, it isn't easy. It isn't easy. How do you summarize someone who is both human and God, who is both carpenter and king, who is blood sacrifice and priest, who is, who is healer and heaven sent? It's not an easy task at all. It's not an easy job. And you, we, want, we would want to choose our words very, very carefully. Now, John the Baptist, we're taught, was given one job by God. One job. And it was a very important job. It was to introduce Jesus to the world. In fact, John's job was so important that it was prophesied about for 600 years before he actually did it. Isaiah said about John, he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And John the Baptist also, he knew Jesus personally. And he had known him since before the crib, since the womb. And, and John was Jesus' first cousin, born just months before Jesus. So if there's anyone qualified to introduce Jesus to the world, it's John. And what did John say? Now, before we get too much into what John said, it's important that we get a picture for John himself because John compared himself with Jesus. Now, John did his work in the wilderness, out in the wilderness. And he got his name Baptist because he was the first to practice people, uh, practice dunking people under the water in order to cleanse them from their sin. John saw that somewhere or made it up and he made that practice his own. And John well, he was a wild card. He was an absolute wild card. Matthew, told, uh, Matthew tells us he wore a garment made from, made from camel's hair, which had to have been hot and itchy during the summer. Can you imagine wearing that thing? And a big old thick leather belt, because if you don't wear a belt, your camel's hair garment may just fall down. That's how those things work. And his diet was, uh, let's say, non-traditional. Non-traditional. He ate locusts, and he ate wild honey. Did he dip the locusts in? And, you know, the, the you know, wild honey, how did he do it? We don't know. The Bible doesn't go into detail there. John was a Nazarite. He was a Nazarite. So he would have had this long hair, long, long hair, which really stinks in some ways. And it was <laughs> likely, likely packed with dust and matted down. And John, whose lifelong calling was to introduce Jesus into the world, well, he was quite a picture of himself. In fact, a lot of people assumed that he was the Messiah that he was the son of God. And John consistently told people, I am not. He said, I'm not even worthy to carry that guy's sandals. But if you think that I am a wild-haired, locust-eating radical who wants to overturn things, well, you should see this guy. You should see this guy. John told the masses that the one who was coming was going to shake things up and shake them up in a big way. Matthew 3, 12. It says, uh, we'll start with, uh, start with th 3.11. Um, he who's coming after me is mightier than me. He's mightier than me. And his winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And we sort of say, gosh, I wonder who he's talking about there because it doesn't sound like Jesus much. We're not used to this Jesus. We're not used to this f fiery chaff burning, uh, winnowing fork brandishing Jesus. That picture of Jesus is very, very foreign to us. Most of us picture a more serene Jesus, a more laid-back Jesus. I, for one, tend to see this, see this picture of Jesus in a painting called The Head of Christ by a guy named Warner Solomon. It's easily among the most uh, reproduced images in the history of the world, maybe the most. 500 million copies of this have been made and, and are floating around the planet. It has been reproduced on little wallet-sized cards and big, big, huge wall-sized canvases. And this painting is the first picture of Jesus that I can remember. I can remember because it hung in my grandparents' house. And a lot of people have had their image of Jesus built by this, by this picture. And it's a very attractive picture. And what makes it so attractive is that it's a very versatile Jesus. Some people look at it and they see this masculine, manly Jesus with his eyes set on something in the distance. Others see a more nurturing, more intimate and loving Jesus, a man who can meet my needs. And this is true. Jesus does meet my needs. Um, but is that all Jesus does? Is Jesus merely some kind of cosmic customer service representative for, the, for dissatisfied members of the human race? 
Is that all that he does? During the early 90s, a British pop band sang a song called Personal Jesus. And the lyrics said that we could call up Jesus any time to confess. He would hear our prayers. We would find someone who cares. Lift up the receiver. He'll make you a believer, they said. He's your own personal Jesus, they say. And for a lot of us, that's the Jesus we know. We have made Jesus into someone, well, who adapts to us. Our picture of Jesus is this infallible God whose convictions surprisingly match my own. He's a God who meets my needs on my timetable, who, who is always there when I call, even if it's only once a decade or so, whether I need it or not. Our picture of Jesus is of a God who, who always affirms us and really, really understands if I just can't go along with some of what he says. He's a laid-back, happy-go-lucky, surfer dude, kind of savior who would never do anything to make me feel uncomfortable or ask anything at all extraordinary of me. He's a made-to-order Jesus. He's a Jesus who's very personal to me, very specific to me. That's the picture a lot of us have of Jesus. And this is a Jesus who is all things to all people, yet particularly and peculiarly small. N.T. Wright put it like this. He said, we have cut Jesus down to size. We have avoided the huge, world-shaking challenge of Jesus' central claim and achievement. We're looking for a builder to build the home we always wanted, but he is an architect coming up with a new plan that would give us everything we always needed. We are looking for a singer to sing the song we've been humming for a long time, but he is the composer bringing a new symphony to which our old songs would be at best background music. My prayer as I have prepared this sermon series and my prayer for you, for me, has been, Jesus, show us the Lord and Savior you truly are. Not the God we think you are. Not the God we want you to be. Not the God that is easy for us. Show us the God you truly are. John knew that God, and John proclaimed three things about Jesus. Three things. First, Jesus has a great passion. He has a great passion. Matthew 3, verses 7 through 9. When John saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. You brood of vipers. Imagine if we told our greeters when people come to church, look at them saying, you brood of vipers when they come in. How would that, would, would that, would that work out well? Not, not, I've been in some churches where it's like that when you walk in. But, uh, you know, John was not big into creating a seeker-friendly church. And, of course, John was addressing here the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and it was fitting that he welcomed them so abruptly because these guys tangled with Jesus for Jesus' entire life. They're the great villains of the gospel. Well, who are they? And why did Jesus get along so terribly with them? And what does it tell us about Jesus? Well, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were two uh, Jewish religious sects. To this, we might say, wait, whoa, 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 wait, hold on. Wasn't Jesus Jewish? What, uh, uh, Jesus was in conflict with fellow Jews. These people were religious. They believed in God. They dedicated their whole life to following God, and they didn't get along with Jesus. Yeah, they believed in God. They just believed that God believed in them too. They believed they were, in the words of the church lady, a little bit superior is what, is, is what they thought. Yeah, that wasn't bad, that little voice. That wasn't bad. George Orwell in, in, in uh, Animal Farm put it like this. All animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. In the Gospels, we see Jesus follow this standard practice. As soon as you believed you were on the inside with God, as soon as you came to understand that you were entitled to anything, as soon as you came to rely upon your own works, your own practices, your, 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 own, your own birthright, your own religion, you were on the outside. You were entitled to nothing. And Jesus showed you just how unworthy your works, your habits, your birthright, it truly is. That's why John told the self-righteous Pharisees and Sadducees that repentance, repentance is your only hope. And if they couldn't repent, well, God will find other children. John said, 
because you think you have Abraham as your father that you're owed, owed anything? God can raise up children from a pile of rocks. And Jesus did. He raised up children from rocks. Rocks that knew they had no business receiving anything from God. You see, Jesus has this great passion for the underdog. The underdog. The first Gentile, the first non-Jewish person from Matthew's gospel uh, that we know met Jesus was a Canaanite woman who cried out, have mercy on me, O Lord. My daughter is oppressed by a demon. Jesus, he didn't even answer her. And the disciples begged him to, to send her away because she wouldn't take no for an answer. And this woman was becoming a real pest. And the, the woman fought her way to Jesus, working through the crowds, past the disciples, and she fell at Jesus' feet and she said, Lord, help me. Guess what Jesus did? Guess what he did? I know what you're thinking. He answered a prayer, of course. He's Jesus. That's what he does. That's what grace do. No, Jesus told her. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. That's what he said to her. Now, we would expect her at this point to leave and to find someone else to heal her daughter, someone who just did not call her a house pet. And any Pharisees or Sadducees standing there would have, would have said, finally, finally this guy gets something right. And the disciples would have been relieved that at least Jesus set some, some kind of limit on his compassion. But this woman was undaunted. She was undaunted. She knew that she deserved nothing. And the only way that she received anything from Jesus was from the absolute overflow of his poured out grace and mercy. She knew that she was the underdog. And you know what? It turns out that being a dog under Jesus' table, it's a pretty good place to be. Pretty good place to be. The woman responded, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat from the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus right there, then and there, celebrated her faith, and he instantly healed her daughter. Jesus has this great passion for the underdog. And if you feel like an underdog this morning, if you feel unworthy, if you feel unrighteous, know that the God who is Lord over all things has a great passion for you. Second, Jesus has great expectations. He has great expectations. Matthew 3.10, it says... John said, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I remember the first boss that I ever had who had the courage to call me on my work, to, to criticize my half-hearted efforts. I felt jobs from the time that I was 13. But it was not until I was almost 25 years old that I had a boss whose standards were high enough and who was willing to enforce those standards by refusing to accept mediocre work. When I first started working there, I, wrote, uh, I, I, uh, I ghost wrote a letter for him. And he called me into his office, he closed the door, and he sat me down, upon which I immediately saw my letter replete with red ink from top to bottom. And he asked, did you want people to assume that I was literate when you wrote this letter for me? And it sort of went downhill from there. Uh, but when my summer was over, my, my standards, my ability to write, my productivity were all greatly improved. I was a better employee. I was a better person than when the work began. I had never had a boss who demanded great things from me. Jesus has great expectations for the people he calls. No sooner had Jesus called all 12 of his disciples, Matthew tells us, that he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He didn't put them, put them through a three-year training course or even through a three-day training course. He told them, heal the sick and raise the dead and cleanse lepers and cast out demons and don't ask to be paid at all for your work. And by the way, don't even take two tunics. And it wasn't like he sent them into a nice, safe place either. Jesus said, hey, this is going to be no cakewalk, guys. Matthew 10, 16 through 18, Jesus said, behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. 
So be wise as serpents and innocent of doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts, flog you in their synagogues. You'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. Wow. That sounds great, doesn't it? That sounds spectacular. Who wouldn't want to sign up for that? You can almost hear the disciples saying to this little piece of news, golly, Jesus, I didn't realize this when I signed up for this a few minutes ago, so uh, that anything was really going to be, you know, asked of me. Is there some kind of B track I could follow? Some kind of, um, I, um, I, I, uh, I, uh, um, other kind of program I could be a part of? We can relate to this, I think. We can relate. In the church, because, well, we believe just giving everyone a trophy because they show up. For us, remedial faith is remarkable. We believe that Jesus tolerates this kind of barren and unproductive immaturity. It's not true. Jesus is just very, very patient. But eventually that tree that does not bear good fruit, he cuts down and at least makes useful for firewood. The, John, the, the Jesus John describes has great expectations. Jesus once cursed a barren fig tree because it, it didn't produce. He cursed it in March. In March, he desired just to bear fruit. John's gospel teaches us that Jesus said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go out and bear fruit that your fruit should abide. As I look at my children, I see, of course, little kids. But in my mind's eye, I also see young men and, and, and a young woman. And as much as I enjoy them, at least most of the time, I want them to grow up. I want them to become someone that contributes to the world, that is something to add, someone who bears fruit. And because I love them, I don't want them to remain children forever. I want them to grow into the full measure of their maturity. I want the boys to seize true manhood. I want for my daughter to become a strong and beautiful woman. You'd be a monster to want your child to remain immature and infantile just so you could care for them. Like any loving parent, Jesus has great expectations. And third and finally, John teaches us that Jesus has a great plan. He has a great plan. Matthew 3.11, it says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Why did Jesus do what he did? What was his motivation? Why would the king of the cosmos live as a peasant? Why would a righteous God allow himself to be convicted as a criminal? Why would the Lord of life suffer death? We think we know the answer to this question, but we don't. We've been told the answer is because he loves you and me so much. We've been taught that we are the precious jewel that he simply hands over everything, including his life, to win back from sin. We like to say that Jesus died for you and me. Untrue. Untrue. At least it's incomplete. That way is a very humanistic way to understand God's word, and it wrongly places us right in the center of the universe. Now, don't get me wrong. We're a part of, big, of Jesus' plan. We're a big part, but his plan is actually much bigger than you and me. And he did die for you and me, but not only for you and me. There's a phrase that appears dozens and dozens of times in the Gospels that tells us exactly what Jesus was seeking, exactly what motivated him. It is the phrase, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. In Matthew, the phrase Jesus uses is kingdom of heaven. And those two interchangeable phrases occur 85 times. 85 times in the Gospels. And at the very beginning of John's description of Jesus, he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see, it is Jesus' great plan to bring about the kingdom of God. It is his great plan to bring about the kingdom of God. So get ready.
get ready. Well, what is the kingdom of God? We're going to spend the next three months answering that question. Dallas Willard defined the kingdom of God in this way. He said, God's own kingdom is the range of his effective will where what he wants done is done. God's own kingdom is the range of his effective will where where he wants done is done. And this, and this definition of Dallas Willard just aligns with what Jesus prayed himself when he called us to pray. Thy kingdom come, say it with me. Thy will be done. We all know it. Jesus came to exert God's will over the world. And we, as the first fruits of his entire creation, he wants first to exert his will in you and me. And he does that, John says, by baptizing us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Through the Holy Spirit, he bends our will to match his. And the Holy Spirit establishes the kingdom of God within us. And Jesus' great plan, great meaning big, his great plan, great meaning wonderful, his great plan, great meaning ambitious, is for us with changed hearts to establish his kingdom in the world. So you and I are not the goal of his plan, but we are his instrument. We are his, we are his instrument. Which brings us back to Warner Solomon and his painting of Jesus. You see, from his youth, Warner Solomon wanted to be a great artist, a great artist in the vein of the old masters, in the vein of, in the vein of uh, Rembrandt and uh, uh, Da Vinci and, and so on and so forth. He wanted, to be, he wanted his art to be discussed and he wanted his art to be known around the world. So he went to the Chicago Art Institute. And while there, he, he, he apprenticed at some of the great art studios in, in Chicago. After that was over, he went to New York to make his name and make his fortune. And it didn't work out. After only a few months, he, he, this, he, he, it, was, it was very clear to him that this plan was not going to work. And he returned to Chicago and he got work as a commercial artist. Now, Solomon was a Christian. And when he was 22, he took a class at Moody Bible Institute. And one of the professors, upon learning that he was an artist, said, good, keep it up. We need Christian artists, and I hope someday you give us a picture of Christ. Ten years later, he had that very opportunity. He had a contract to paint the cover of a magazine published by the Evangelical Covenant Church, February 1924 edition. And Solomon, feeling, feeling the, uh, the, uh, the burden of the moment, prayed and prayed and prayed and sought God for, for inspiration, and nothing happened. And, and days passed, and, and weeks passed, and nothing came. And at midnight, the night before the deadline, the night before the morning of the deadline, he sat, he, after sitting at his drawing board for six straight hours, Solomon went to bed exhausted and in total despair over missing his deadline and missing his opportunity. He woke with a start at 2 a.m. And this clear vision, this clear picture filled his head. And he quickly ran upstairs to his studio where he, where he made a quick charcoal sketch of, of that vision, a sketch that became the head of Christ, a picture that was reproduced 500 million times and distributed around the world and actually united the church across the denominations following World War II. Jesus used an unknown commercial artist, a man of failed great ambition, collapsed at his desk from exhaustion and frustration to give the world a picture and proclaim the kingdom of God. The Jesus John the Baptist knows has a great passion for the underdog. He has great expectations for you and me, and he has a great plan. So let's get to know that Jesus. Let's get to know him. Amen.